You know, we are launching this Sunday our summer playlist series, which means we will have a series of guest speakers during this month of July. We're starting off this morning with Matthew Grundy, and we call this the summer playlist series because we have asked each speaker to bring in a song that means something special, is important to them in some way, and to use the song to deliver a message. So what we're going to do right now is check out Matthew Grundy's song, and then as he comes up, would you guys please give him a big Bridge Church welcome. Church. Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. It's so good to be here today with you all. I love you so much. This place, uh, it's funny because I'm actually moving to the other side of the country this Wednesday. And what's interesting is when I first moved to Fresno nine years ago, the bridge was one of the first churches we visited. And it's just amazing to see the good that God was doing then and the goodness that he's doing now because he's doing a new thing. Amen. This is a new series, uh, the summer series kickoff. You just heard a song called You've Got a Friend in Jesus. And I love that song because it reminds me of a summer in which God got a hold of me. He took out the old heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh and changed my affections. And I got to know him. It's called being born again, you know. And I'm thankful for that summer. It was a June 6th. I'll never forget it where that happened. And, uh, you know, summers are marked by new things happening. Um, some of you, they're little ones that you have or grandkids, and you know summer's marked because now they're around the house more. They're not in school, and they're yelling and having a good time. And then the newness of summer for you is trying to figure out what to do with all that new time that they now have. You know, I, I love the newness of baptism and what it symbolizes that we've seen here today. Or earlier in the earlier service, there was a uh, baby dedication. That's new. Um, there's so many new things happening. There's obviously in Fresno, we're familiar with the new wave of heat that uh, descends upon us. I, I was joking with the, <laughs> with the church earlier. I was saying, you know, I moved here nine years ago. Uh, <clears throat> after nine summers, I was reflecting on the fact that when I moved here, I was actually Caucasian. And... Uh, <laughs> This is nine summers work. <laughs> oh, no, but uh, God is good. And he's always doing new things. And so my hope today in this message about you having a friend in Jesus, perhaps to remind some of you of that friendship, perhaps to encourage or inspire others of you in here to go into that relationship. And what I like to consider a little bit of provoking godly jealousy I hope I can be provoked to godly jealousy, and you too. What do I mean by godly jealousy? The Bible says that God is jealous for us. I'm glad the Bible does not say he's jealous of us. Obviously, I've got nothing <laughs> worth anything that he hasn't already given, um, so there's nothing for him to be jealous of me about or you about, but he's jealous for us. He wants us. He wants relationship with us. He yearns for it. It's what he's thinking about all the time, and it's the reason why Jesus came to this earth. And so I want to invite us into a little bit of godly jealousy in these moments we have together. We might begin to look at him in a new way and see him newly as we start this new series called You've Got a Friend in Jesus Today. Can you pray with me? Father, I'm just so thankful that you would allow me to spend time with these, your wonderful people, Lord. I love you you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we're thankful that your presence is here, that you'd speak to each one of us individually, independently, touch the recesses of our heart, 
Help us to see you differently. And not only see you differently, start to relate with you differently. We're just eager to know more right now. Fashion our hearts. Help them bear fruit for your glory. That we might know that we have a friend in Jesus. Amen. So where this started with me was not too long ago. God's been taking me on this little journey. I want to invite you into it. Uh, my wife and I, we fell in love. We met uh, in a math class at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And there, the best thing happened to me at USC was meeting her. But, yeah, amen. But in addition to that, I developed this affinity for USC football. And I'm one of those people, who, some of you are in here, you don't have to, you know, dime yourself out. But I'm one of those people who look forward to football season. And I'm on the edge of my couch and I'm like screaming at the screen because I'm so engaged with USC football. And on one particular day, I remember distinctly, I was yelling at my screen, I was cheering, I was having a good time. And all of a sudden, God starts speaking to me. And he asked me a question. He said, Matthew, do you want to know who my favorite player is on the team? Sure. Yeah, God, I would like to know who your favorite player is. He told me the person's name. And he went on to, I asked him, well, or actually he told me, he said, you want to know why? That's what happened. And I said, sure, God, why? And he went on to tell me how this particular player was very humble, hardworking. He had been stewarding his gifts really well. And I'm just like, wow, that's so cool, God. Like, I like him too, and that's really cool. That's your favorite player. That's cool. And then my, my head caught up with this conversation I was having. And I thought to myself, there's no way God's talking to me about college football right now. It's just not happening. And then him knowing my thoughts, he spoke to me. And he said, Matthew, don't you as a dad care about what your kids care about? And then he said, don't you care about what your friends are interested in? And then it dawned on me. God is my friend. I don't know if I ever thought about him in that way and certainly never thought about having conversations with him about USC football. It seems like such a trivial thing to me. But at the end of the day, God revealed that he was interested in friendship. And I believe today he's going to preach to the choir, so to speak, for many of you who are friends of God, because there's quite a few. And for some of you who aren't, he's going to invite you in because he is interested in friendship. You know, this is no secret in the word we see it in John chapter 15 and verse 15. We'll turn there. If you're online, you'll see it on the screen. John chapter 15 and verse 15. It's an interesting passage. Jesus was getting ready to be crucified, to die, be raised. And before he leaves the disciples, he, go, he tells them, he says this in John chapter 15, verse 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. What Jesus is doing here and what he really revealed to me is there's like levels to this thing in relationship with God. Like he starts off saying, I no longer call you servants. He's almost saying that's a, it's an important level, but it's an inferior level. There's a higher level. He says, I call you friends. And how does he describe that level of friendship? Because of what he makes known to us. It's the level of intimacy, he's saying, is the thing that marks friendship and marks relationship, frankly, and its various levels. You know, I, when I got saved, um, Jesus made me new. I remember coming across a passage in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12. It's Moses. And perhaps unknowingly, I've, I've watched Moses through Scripture and, and prayed this prayer my whole life since I've been uh, born again over myself. And I'll share it with you. Many of you may remember Moses being the servant of God. He said this. He said, if you're pleased with me, in some translations, if you're pleased with your servant, he says, teach me your ways. He's talking to Father. Teach me your ways that I might know you. He says, if you're pleased with your servant, teach me your ways that I might 
know you. Um, This is really important because first and foremost, we know God answered that prayer. In the book of Psalms, the Bible says that the Israelites are familiar with God's acts, but Moses was familiar with his ways. God answered that prayer. God said, yeah, I'm going to take you to a deeper level in this. Let's be friends. I'll be honest. It's a Humbling thing to think about any of the following three that I want to talk about. You know, there's this relationship that we have an opportunity to enter into where we are the servant and he is the Lord. And honestly, that's overwhelming for me to even consider. The fact that God himself came here and died for me. He didn't have to. He died for you. He didn't have to. In fact, to the contrary, considering the fact that all we offered him was a sinful life because none are righteous, no, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God, and yet he died a terrible death for each one of us. For me to be called a servant of God, for you to be called a servant of God, what an honor. What an honor to call him Lord. Now, if that's not enough, think about the second part, being called a son or daughter. I mean, not only do I get to serve him, him be my Lord and me serve him, but to be called a son, to be grafted into the family, like I'm a member of the family. I mean, oh my goodness, church, isn't this, is beyond comprehension. And sometimes we just take for granted God's goodness that we can be called sons or daughters. But then there's yet another level. It's altogether wonderful. It's called being a friend. Of God. Before we dive into the latter, I want to start with the former. I want to talk about the servant Lord relationship because I think this is an important starting line for us to just establish. In Proverbs 1, chapter 7, the Bible says this it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Notice the beginning, it's the starting line. Of all knowledge. Now, when we use that word knowledge, remember the word know, some of you should be familiar, maybe should be familiar. Anytime that's used, it's a word that marks intimacy. Okay? The Bible says Adam knew Eve and they had a son. The Bible said Joseph did not know Mary until she had the Christ child. So, what we see is that the word know is a word that actually is putting our focus on intimacy. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge or the beginning of all intimacy. See, sometimes in Christian, and what I found is that some people come to a relationship with God as Father first, but they've never established a relationship as Lord first. But God says the beginning, the starting line, is actually that servant-Lord relationship. It's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of all knowledge. Remember Paul, on his road to Damascus. You remember? He's going along. He's blinded by this great and wonderful light. And the first words out of his mouth were, who are you, Lord? See, the beginning of his walk with God started with this this recognition of who is Lord and who's the servant. Think about Peter. Um, You remember the passage? Peter's fishing all night. He's not catching anything. Jesus shows up. He says, cast your net to the other side. He casts a net. He pulls in a hole so big the boat is about to capsize. It's about to, it's taking on water. Just this one miracle brings Peter to himself. He falls on his knees and he says this word. He says, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. You see, both of these two greats, these giants in the Bible, that are not really giants, they just have a giant God working with them. They came into this this place of relationship with God with the initial recognition and this initial starting line of knowing God as Lord. And from there came everything else. And so for us, too, we must come to know him as Lord first before we go any deeper. And today we're going to have this opportunity, I believe, for those of you who have not received God, as your Lord, and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. It's going to be your day. Amen. Amen. But that's the starting line. And we'll need to go back and make sure that is established before we go any further. But there is a further. 
There's this thing called friendship. And there's this passage in Proverbs 18, 24. I want to read it to you. It says this. It says, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You see, I don't know about you, but in this levels of relationship, I always thought of it as this. I thought it went servant, friend, son. I thought son was the height. When in fact, it's not. The Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In other words, friendship love has even greater depths to it or a different light to it than even familial love can give us. And that relationship is, I believe, what God is after. You know, I remember one day, so my, my wife and I, Jocelyn, we have six kids. And I remember my daughter, Naomi. She's 16. She's going to be a senior this year. And I remember one day we were just sitting, she was sitting on the couch, she was sitting on the bed actually, and we're just talking, and she looks at me and she says, Daddy, I just want you to know you're my best friend. Yeah, that's what I did. I was like, you know, inside, I was like, oh, I was like melting. I mean, those of you who are parents, grandparents, you know what that would do to you or what it has done to you. Now, make no mistake about it. I'm not interested in a friend-first relationship with my daughter. She has a healthy fear of the Lord with her dad. Okay? <laughs> so friendship first is not what I've desired. But the fact that she came to me and said, Daddy, you're my best friend, it did something to me. It rearranged my world. It made me think so differently, and it melted my heart. Could it be that God is interested in you? being his friend? And what will it do to his heart if you say, God, you're my best friend? You know, there's um, this passage, again, talking about godly jealousy earlier, remember that? There's this, a couple passages of people that I've really looked up to in the word. The first is found in James chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. And in this passage, we hear about Abraham and it says that scripture was fulfilled where it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called, watch this, the friend of God. Of Moses, we mentioned earlier in Exodus 33, verse 11, it says this, and the Lord spoken to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now I want you to think about this. I want you to just pause for a second and just consider this. What would it be like to, for God to speak to you, you for, for you to hear him say, insert your name, you're my friend. I mean, you want to talk about humbling? You want to talk about uh, the goodness of God leading to repentance? It's God saying, you're my friend. It's, it's almost beyond thought. Now, the reality is when uh, Moses died, it's interesting, in Joshua 1, 2, the Lord told Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. The importance there is that we never lose the relationship, the foundations in a servant-lord relationship, even if we move on to being sons and daughters and friends. But the fact of the matter is friends is something to be greatly desired and greatly pursued. And so as you and I are considering friendship with God, I want to ask you a question that he asked me as he's been walking me down this journey of friendship with him. He asked me a simple question one day. He said, Matthew, what do good friends do? And I thought about it for a second, and I realized, just like we have a lot to learn from the children who are up here dancing and having fun in church, yes, we can dance and have fun in church, and some of us need to just become like children again. Remember, he said, if you want to inherit the kingdom, you must become like these. We have so much to learn from children. And so I wanted to turn to children to hear from them on what the answer to this question is. What do good friends do? I think there's a lot we can learn from this. And perhaps if we consider our relationship with God, maybe we can see that we can learn from what they have to share. Let's take a look. What makes a good friend? A friend is somebody who you, you meet up with often when people play with you. Always 
hugs me. Um, a good friend is someone who picks you up when you fall, makes you laugh, plays with you whenever you're sad, and like just would just do lots of things for you. Helping you and just being kind. Give them some of my toys. <sighs> to be kind to each other and you don't argue. Or if they listen to you very nicely, we can play with them or we can play with somebody else. And you be kind to them and you never argue with them. Um, accepting for who you are and what you're doing every day. If they're kind to you, if you're ever like sad or angry. He's always been there for me to help me. If you're playing the game, you can let them join in. If they don't want to, you can just say if he wants to join in, you can. I think makes a good friend is that they take care of you and when they, if you fall over, they help you, they pick you up. I think a good friend makes you um, happy and is always lovely to you and it's always like funny and nice to you. I don't know, but I've got a lot of friends in the class. I know that. Isn't that sweet? Perhaps we can consider what they shared. What if this is exactly what friendship with God looks like? Someone said, a good friend is someone who you meet up with often. They play with you. They pick you up when you fall. They make you laugh. They help you, and they're kind. They give you some of their toys. <laughs> and they listen to you very nicely. Could it be that this is exactly what God desires of us as friends? You know, when I thought of it, um, friends spend time together. That's called prayer. Um, they make you laugh. You know, God has told me some of the funniest jokes you can imagine. Oh, he created laughter. <laughs> and we got to remember that he laughs. Like that video we saw earlier, that's not the first image when we came up and we saw the video from The Chosen, that's often not the first image we see of God. We think of him, that he's dancing with his friends. But in fact, that's exactly and precisely what God is interested in doing. So the next question we have to ask is, how do I become a friend? If we say, yes, I want to be a friend, how do you become a friend? Because the words that I mentioned earlier, I am jealous for you. Those words, I am jealous for you, those are not the words of a, serve, of a master to a servant. I am jealous for you are the words from a friend to a friend. Saying, I want you. I want you. All of you. So how do I become a friend? Well, back in that passage we read earlier in Proverbs 18, 24, my wife, she always makes fun of me because, you know, I've come on this journey here in Fresno these last nine years, and I was leading Habitat for Humanity in our region, and then the Lord sent me to become deputy mayor for the city of Fresno, and I've met thousands and thousands of wonderful people in this area, and I, my wife and I love Fresno because we think people make the place, and so we love it here. But my wife always teases me. She says, Matthew, you have a lot of acquaintances, but you have very few friends. You need more friends. And I'm like, well, you know, I've, you know, I've got the Lord, and I've got you, and, and we have six children together, so I'm like, man, I've got plenty of friends. But she's like, no, you, you need more friends. And so that passage in Proverbs 18, 24 is good because it says, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. In her vernacular, she always says, Matt, you need to put yourself out there more. You got to show yourself friendly. So the question is, what do friends, good friends do? How do you become a good friend? And, you know, I was thinking about it. I'm like, well, a good friend 
you know, you, you call them. You know, you talk to them. Again, uh, you call them often. That, that's called prayer. How often are we calling God? Do you, I'm thankful for the moments of intercession and where we are dedicated to the routine of prayer. There are folks in here, I know some of you, you wake up at 3 a.m. every morning and you're praying, you're interceding, and you're pressing in. And those things are essential. Those are really important for us to advance the kingdom. But if I only call God, if I only pray on a routine, I mean, how would your friend feel if you only called them every day at 1 o'clock? Or you only picked up the phone right before you were about to eat. Like God's interested in friendship because a servant prays out of obligation. A friend prays out of desire. I want to call you because I miss you, because I love you. I want to tell you about my day. Uh, how are you doing today? What's going on in your world? So my prayers have changed as I started to walk in friendship with God. I wake up and I say, hey, God, how are you doing today? What are you up to today? That's the conversations. It's evolving as my view of friendship with God has changed. A servant says, you know what? I have to behave. And yes, we must obey. A measure of our love towards God is measured in our obedience. He says, if you love me, you keep my commands. So that servant-master relationship is key. But a servant only says, I must obey. When you move beyond that, a friend says, I want to behold. I just want to behold you, Lord. I just want to sit with you. I just want to see you. How many of you know that if your best friend was in a room with you, you're watching your favorite TV show, or you're hanging out listening to your favorite music, you don't even have to say anything. You could just sit in a room with them and just smile and nod. Because you're beholding them. You're appreciating their presence in your life. You're loving just who they are. And God is interested in that too. When we're driving down the street, just look over at the passenger seat and say, God, thanks for riding with me. Or we're eating dinner and, and there's an extra seat. And you say, God, thanks for eating here with me. He just wants to be a friend. You've got a friend, friend in Jesus, like we heard earlier. And, and you know what? As a friend, there are certain things that I do and that I don't do out of love and appreciation, respect for my friends. James 4.4 4 says it this way. It says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. As we are friends with God, there are certain things I can and cannot do out of respect for my friendship with him. Like with my natural friends in the world, I'm not going to go talk behind my friend's back when they're not there. That's showing my disloyalty and my not being a friend. Likewise, as it pertains to my relationship with God and friendship with him, there are certain things I can do and certain things I can't do. I'm not going to watch certain movies. Sure, because there's a command, and I'm his servant, to not work, watch certain movies. But as my friend, I don't want to hurt his, as his friend, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Like, there's certain music I won't listen to. Yeah, perhaps as a servant, I know better. But as a friend, I don't want to pull him into that too. And so friendship, by grace, is a whole nother level. It's beyond the law. It's saying, I love you. And I want to honor our relationship, and God wants us to be his friend. You know, this view of friendship with God has changed my whole perspective, not just in how I pray and talk with him and walk with him, but even in how I'm reading scripture. I'm going to turn our attention to this passage you guys just came out of Luke, in Luke chapter 11. And in Luke chapter 11, you remember, this is where we hear the Lord's Prayer. And it starts off with this father son or daughter relationship. You remember our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what's interesting is after this father relationship, it goes on in verse five, he starts teaching about friends. He almost transitions seamlessly into friends. And then in verse 9, this is what he says. Watch this. He says, so I say to you, on the heels of the context of friendship, he says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
I want to introduce you to my son named Levi. Levi, the priest, 10 years old, full of life. I love him. The interesting thing about Levi, and there you see him on the one side, he's got a, a chocolate-covered Rice Krispie treat covered with M&Ms, and he's in awe. And on the other side, he's got a milkshake that's on the top of it, has a donut and a cookie. I'm being an excellent parent, as you can see. <laughs> but this is Levi's good times, you know? What you, what's interesting about Levi is I remember one day, because um, he's so full of life, I come home from work. Like, hey, Levi, how's your day? Oh, not too great, Daddy. Why? He said, well, I was at lunch, and I was going through the lunch line, and, you know, the lunch lady offered me two options, option A and option B. I said I wanted option B. She gave me option A. I'm like, well, what'd you do, Levi? He said, nothing. I kept moving because that's the lunch lady. God bless our lunch ladies, you know, she was living up to her stereotype. If there's any lunch ladies in here, I'm sorry. But while you may find that story amusing, I found it even more interesting because I know Levi. Now, Levi at home is one of the most determined people I've ever met in my life. Levi cannot take no for an answer. He'll present his case, and if I say no, he'll come back with a different set of data points, hoping he'll get a different result. And then after I say no to that, he'll come back, he'll recalculate things, and he will ask and keep on asking. See, what I realize as I'm reading scripture and thinking and looking through the lens of friendship, what I realize is there are levels to this. You see, at lunch, Levi is viewing himself and the lunch lady purely as master servant. But at home, because I'm father and friend, he's more comfortable with ask and keep on asking. So too should we. Consider God when he's giving us this command to ask and keep asking. He's not saying, he's saying, listen, it's okay to ask and keep asking because sometimes me and my view of him as only as Lord and, and, and me as servant, I think once he said no, okay, yes, Lord. And that's, there's moments for that. Don't get me wrong. But there are moments where he's saying ask and keep asking because he wants us to view relationship as friends. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that may be revolutionary. Maybe not on the heels of everything that I've already said. God wants friends. Let me go further. He wants you as his friend. I don't know if anyone's told you it. Perhaps they have. I bet they have here at Bridge Church. God wants you to be his friend. What an honor. What, what can we say? That the God of the universe, the ancient of days, Elohim, wants to be friends with us? What is this? What sort of goodness is this? What sort of wonder is this? This is good news. Jesus paid the ultimate price. He didn't just die for servants. He didn't just die for sons. He died for friends. And this is the highest attainment of love that's out there. We see it in John 15, 13. He says, for there is no greater love than this. There's none greater than a man who lays down his life for his friends. The highest attainment or level of love God describes is friendship love. Why? Because you have to choose it. And he chooses you to be his friend. And he's saying, will you choose back? You've got a friend in Jesus. You've got a friend in Jesus, the God of the universe, saying, I want to be your friend. What will we say to that invitation? What will we say? Uh, you know, my mentor, 20 years ago, I'll never forget he told me, he said, Matthew, 20 years from now, your DNA is going to be the same. 20 years from now, wherever you are, the blood running through your vein is going to be the same. But the two things that will change you are the books you read and the friends you hang out with. The books you read and the friends you hang out with. I want to invite you into friendship with Jesus.
The first invitation today is for those who have not started at the starting line just yet. You're not certain that God is your Lord. And remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the starting line of all knowledge, of all intimacy. If you say to yourself, listen, I don't know that I know that he's my Lord. God is saying, listen, I came down. I died. I was beaten beyond the point of recognition. My own mother couldn't recognize me. I hung bloodied and naked on a tree for you. And not only that, I died. I defeated death, hell, and the grave. And I rose again to new life. And I'm praying for and pleading for you even now. Standing for you still even now. He's saying, will you stand with me? Not for man, but for him. If you say, I want to know that I know and make the Lord Jesus, your Lord, repenting of your sins to accept the free gift of salvation that he purchased on your behalf, go ahead and stand with me. (sighs) Praise the Lord. From the balcony, from the back to the front, if you're saying, yeah, that's me, I want to know that he's my Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to the Lord for what he's doing. Because let me tell you, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. He says, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. We acknowledge that, we, that none of us are righteous, no, not one. That we need him, that he alone can save us. That there's no other name under heaven given whereby men might be saved. The name of Jesus. And Jesus wants to be your Lord. So would you pray with me? Bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for stirring up hearts. I thank you for speaking to the recesses of the hearts of these, your people. And I thank you that you're doing a new work. This is a new series on a new day and a new summer. And you are giving new life right now in Jesus' name to those who would receive you by faith. In the name of Jesus, I just pray that you move mightily in their lives. Breathe a fresh wind upon them. Let them be changed forevermore. For those of you who would agree and are standing with the Lord to accept him as your Lord and Savior, you can repeat after me, Heavenly Father, thank you for living for me, for dying for me, and raising again. Thank you for sending your son Jesus on my behalf. He lived a life I couldn't live. He died a death I should have died. But here I am today declaring that you are my Lord. I repent of my sins and I invite you in to make me new. Make me like you. I receive the gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. Everybody who agree with that, go ahead and say amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes, 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 yes. Now, I won't purposely declare you saved, but the Bible says he who began a good work will complete it. Evidence that he's began it is that he'll complete it in your life. And so I encourage you to keep coming to a good church like this one. Read this word and talk to him. Talk to him in prayer. Now, For everyone else, you can remain standing. For everyone else who would say, you know what, Matt? I've been provoked to godly jealousy. I want to know him as friend. And I want to grow in the depths of my relationship with him as friend. If you say yes to that, go ahead and stand with us. Cool. Praise the Lord. If you are able, that's awesome. Yeah. I want us to bow our heads. Let's just center our eyes on the Lord for a second here. This is the second service. There's no one after us, so I don't feel so bad about that clock that's run red on me. (laughs) Now that I want to honor each of you. Father, thank you for each of these, Lord, that you brought here today, that you know them by name. And Lord, you knew them before they were formed in their mother's womb. Because you wanted them to know you as Lord. But Father, you also wanted them to be called sons and daughters. And even now today, you say, I want more. I want you to be my friend. So God, I'm thankful that 
This is not like little kids where we write on a letter, will you be my friend, yes or no? <laughs> we just get to say, yes, Lord, we'll be your friend because we know that you're asking us to be your friend. So for each one of us in here today that would say, I want to be a friend of God. God is saying to you right now, will you be my friend? What will you say? Yeah. Yes, Lord. Everyone who would say, yeah, I hear the Lord and I've heard him through this message. And my answer is yes. Just say with me, say, yes, Lord. I will be your friend. Lord, now I pray that each one of these, my friends, your sons and daughters and your friends, that they would show themselves friendly to you, that they would walk in these things and consider you as a friend all the days of their lives from here forward, that they would know and they would know you as friend and that they would be a good friend and that this perspective would change their entire lives. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we thank you for your friendship. Amen. Amen. Guys, it's been an honor to be here with you. I love you. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.